Hi, everyone. Um, as a second year student and co-leader of the Marketing Club here, um, thanks again, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm excited to really kick things off this morning by introducing Kevin Ryan, the founder and CEO of Guilt Group, which is a groundbreaking e-commerce company offering highly coveted products and services and experiences at insider prices. And my closet and I can personally attest to the compelling nature of their business model. <laughs> Guilt Group's innovative offerings have inspired a growing and evolving industry of web-based private flash sales. And since its establishment in 2007, Guilt has continued to lead a redefinition of the world of online shopping. So it's no surprise then that Kevin is one of the leading internet entrepreneurs in the US, having founded several New York-based businesses in addition to Guilt Group, such as Business Insider and cloud software company Tengen. He also helped build DoubleClick from a startup in 1996 to a publicly traded international company in 2005 as president and then CEO. Currently, Kevin serves on the board of the Yale Corporation, Human Rights Watch, and INSEAD, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He holds a BA from Yale University and an MBA from INSEAD. Um, please join me in welcoming Kevin. Thank you. Let me just uh, put my watch down so I don't lose track of time. So uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, uh, I'm particularly excited to be here. Obviously, uh, I've been involved with Yale for a long time and uh, increasingly involved. I went on the board uh, last May, um, which has you know, been a real chance. I've been involved with a number of Yale things before, but it was a real chance to sort of recommit and get really excited and learn uh, about aspects of Yale, like the med school and others that I didn't know that much about when I was here as an undergrad. And it is a remarkable, remarkable institution that's doing very, very well. Today we're here to talk about uh, marketing, and uh, you know, for the for the students in the room, it is a fascinating time in marketing. <clears throat> it's a very complicated time, and I think 25 years ago, people in business school, if there were 10 of you and you thought uh, who should go into marketing, you actually sat there and pointed to the one who was sort of a little more creative, a little less mathematical, that was like the person who could design a, a, a TV commercial in your mind, and that was sort of the stereotype of marketing at the time. And that has really evolved. Obviously, being creative is a good part, an important part of marketing, but now it's become increasingly quantitative and increasingly complex. And that complexity really comes from the fact that there are so many different ways to reach the consumer. And each business has different tools. They overlap. Uh, are they redundant? Are they, uh, did they reinforce? You know, those are complicated uh, problems. Um, so my context comes from um, a couple of the companies that were mentioned today. So on the one hand, uh, DoubleClick was a marketing infrastructure company, so we provided ad technology, but we also had one of the largest email technology companies, so we went to, to uh, our clients, thousands of them, and provided the infrastructure for them to send uh, email campaigns. Also owned one of the largest offline direct marketing companies, so for better or worse, uh, a large catalog cooperative with uh, billions of transactions, so you know, when you buy uh, from one catalog, other catalogs send you uh, free of charge, um, lots of uh, catalogs to you. Well, actually, that was our unit that, that manipulated the data, modeled it, and predicted that you should receive a catalog. Uh, and so we actually touched almost every aspect of marketing. I was on the board of the DMA. So that was sort of marketing infrastructure. Then I launched two consumer companies. Guilt is one. We have about 1,000 employees now. We started five and a half years ago. Uh, it's, so it's a pretty big operation in men's, women's, home, kids, travel, uh, local. Uh, and then Business Insider which I'll talk about for a second, online business site um, that uh, launched also actually the same month, uh, five and a half years ago. Uh, and then a, a very technical company called Tengen, which is more of an enterprise, which is uh, less relevant today. So I'm gonna start for a second on the, on, there's two aspects of marketing. One is sort of the launch of something, and then there's sort of a larger company, and what you, and the tools you have at that time. One of the things I say in the launch of a company for Business Insider or Guilt, um, which is sort of contrary to what probably many people would say, is I think it's essential that you do no advertising. Um, I think advertising is a crutch at that point. Uh, you don't have any, you have no idea what your lifetime value of customers is. Now you'd come to me, and this happens all the time, you have a startup idea, you come to me and say, look, obviously no one knows my company, so we need to advertise. And the answer is you, you don't. All successful companies, you know, the Facebooks of the world, the guilts of the world, business inside of the world, those companies did it without advertising. So the question is, how do they do that? And the answer is, you have to rely on your product. Your product has to be so good 
that people love it and go on. And that's a hard burden. I've started a bunch of different companies. A lot of them have worked. Some haven't. And the bottom line is, if it's not compelling enough, sometimes you have a good product, it's just not a great product. And you will, you will pay the price very, very quickly. Advertising will be poured down the toilet at that point. Uh, and so you just need to focus every bit of energy you would have focused on advertising and the money and put it into your product. So Business Insider is the best example of that. So this is an idea. Uh, I remember going to people and saying, look, I'm thinking of launching a new business site that covers you know, business in general online. And uh, a bunch of people said to me, you know, Kevin, you've had some good ideas in the past. This isn't one of them. This is, I mean, there's like 100 sites. And there are brands that have been around for 100 years. And they're all online. It's not like the Wall Street Journal is not online. And the FT and Reuters and AP and CNBC and all these guys, Business Week, Fortune, Forbes. I mean, the list goes on. So and you're going to start with no money. And your idea is you're going to hire two people to start writing to a blog. And you're not going to advertise. And, and you think that's going to work. Um, and so today, we have uh, about 24 million uniques coming to the site with that strategy, which uh, was essentially a non-marketing strategy. Um, 24 million uniques, we're about the same size now. Uh, in fact, the three biggest in the world now are the Journal, Bloomberg, and us online. We're three times the size of the FT in terms of people coming to the site. It's all measured in number of uniques coming to the site. Never done any advertising. We never even issued a press release announcing that we were, had started the site. So all we did, and this, uh, this is a pretty limited strategy, <coughs> two people started writing to a blog. And now today we have 100 people. Uh, 45 journalists, although I'll note that the two competitors we have have each somewhere between 10 and 20 times more journalists than we do, and our traffic is about the same. So um, that now, the product is really good, and we figured out that in phase two, what really matters in that industry, each industry is a little bit different. So there, SEO, in addition to your product, SEO and showing up in search results is the most important thing. And so grabbing those people, in fact, I didn't even realize this when we started it, because I, most people think of a daily uh, newspaper as you go in and you want to see what happened yesterday. 50% of the people who come to Business Insider are looking at stories that are more than five days old. What that tells you is that if you're, you're doing a search, you're doing a search for Kevin Ryan, or you're doing a search for Eric Schmidt, or you're doing a search for something, the chemical industry, those results have to show up. It brings you to the site for free. And then uh, sometimes you never come back, and sometimes you think, gosh, this is kind of an interesting site. I'll come back. And so I would calculate today that probably 95% of the people who are on Business Insider today originally came to the site through search results. And I don't think that every day, you know, Business Week wakes up and thinks that that's the most important thing. And it is. It's just the way it works. It's not the way we want it to work, it just is the way it works. Because um, <clears throat> we didn't have the tools that other people have. For example, um, I'll, when I talk about guilt, PR is a very important part of the strategy there. Business Insider, it can't be, um, for an odd reason. I was about to go on CNBC once, uh, just doing some commentary, and so the person ahead of time said, so just remind me of the three companies you're, you're, you've started and working with. I said, guilt, and there's Tengen and Business Insider. And she goes, yeah, we don't, we don't talk about Business Insider. <clears throat> Like, really? That, I didn't realize that we just openly, and she goes, no, she goes, no, they're, they're competitive, so we don't talk about them. Uh, so we have trouble getting publicity um, in the business press, oddly enough, for what is an incredibly successful property. Uh, so we won't be reading about it on other sites, um, but you'll have to have to go to it itself. Uh, Gilt, on the other hand, um, has, has a, a more complex, in some ways easier, in some ways harder set of marketing challenges. So there, of course, no one knew what we were. This is a unique challenge because it's a, you know, when we started, it was members only. So you had to be invited in from an existing member. So you'll notice the flaw, which is we had no members. So <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to be invited by people when there are no members. And yet you have to maintain that exclusivity feeling. So what we did is we uh, went out and there were, uh, uh, there were eight of us, eight employees at the time. And so we emailed all of our close friends. Close friends being defined as anyone we'd ever met. <laughs> Actually, I hadn't met them all. But I, I, we had email addresses, at least, uh, from somewhere. So we had 8,000 uh, contacts in our, between all of us. And so we emailed them all. And uh, 2,000 people said yes, that they would go to it. And the first day, uh, I needed to create this feeling of exclusivity. And this is all part of the product, the brand, and the positioning. 
And so we only had 50 dresses. It was a Zach Posen sale, 50 dresses. You have no idea if anyone's gonna buy it. So I told the guys, look, we're starting the sale at noon, and at one o'clock, put sold out on everything. Because that'll convince people that it was really a hot sale, and everything's gone. Because uh, I was worried that we'd be sitting there with 50 dresses. Um, and I said, look, don't do it all in one second. Just like pretend you know, every two minutes that it's, it's gone. And it turned out, actually, all the sale, they all did sell. We didn't have to do that, but I was willing to do that. Um, and uh, so we, we started from there, and we could just see you know, three weeks in that every single day, every single week, it was growing. So what was the key thing we did? Because we obviously have no money at this point. Uh, we haven't raised any outside funds, uh, so it's difficult. So we have to rely on PR. And there we put together a pretty good strategy. You may have, if those of you who followed, you may have read about Alexis and Alexandra, two women who actually weren't there in the beginning. They actually were people that started three and five months after the first employee. You would say, that's not really, that's not really a founder. But uh, I was putting the team together, realized I had a positioning there that would be very, very effective. And two, one, one, first of all, both fantastic with the company today. And one had uh, worked at Louis Vuitton in, uh, in Bulgari. One had worked at eBay. Both were at Harvard Business School. Both had been Harvard undergraduate. Uh, so really a great synopsis of what the brand was. I was not really a great synopsis of what the brand was. No real fashion background. I had lived in New York for 15 years. I had actually never been to Bergdorf's, uh, the women's <laughs> department store. I was in a meeting. I was in a meeting uh, with some brands like a month after it started and everyone started referring to Bergdorf's on, on did I like what they had done on the third floor? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I think what they did was, was stylish and, uh, and, 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 but yet contemporary. And in fashion, you can get away with a lot of things that don't mean anything at all. And every brand says, yeah, that's us, that's us. So then I went actually, it turns out Bergdorf's is a very nice store. And um, I have now been to it. Now I've been more immersed uh, in the last five years. But uh, so part of the brand, PR, extremely important. So more so than most brands. And we use it effectively. I always spend more on PR than uh, most brands. I have eight full-time people in-house doing PR and have had for a while. Now why? Because one, we can measure the exact results. But I'll give you a good example of how you create PR. It doesn't just happen. So. Um, Women, if you, if you run, reach uh, women, the morning shows is one of the, the biggest audiences. And so they, uh, the Today Show, Good Morning America. So we've been on 17 times in the last year. So how, how do you do that? Because they don't want to just run a segment saying, gosh, Guild is a great place. So what, we, what I did is I found the person who worked for Connie and Ast, who had incredible relationships with all the morning shows and was sort of an editor who worked, not surprisingly, for Connie and Ast, hired her and then started packaging segments, which, uh, so for example, fall trends. Fall trends, people, they, they want to do a segment for three minutes on fall trends. So our editor goes on, positions something so that Good Morning America doesn't have to do anything at all. We show up, she says, look, fall trends, plaid is in. Let me show you some examples. And it all says the guilt editor. One of the things comes from guilt, or some of our brands are from guilt, but some don't. So it's as objective as it you know, needs to be so that it doesn't feel like a guilt commercial, but a lot of guilt. And then we put together some shopping segments because the shows wanted it. So actually yesterday morning, we uh, had chocolate covered strawberries, special offer. Uh, so 1,000 people bought it uh, within three minutes. Um, it was at a discount. So we made probably no money on it, but didn't cost us any money. But three minutes, they talked about on guilt, you can get these chocolate covered strawberries. They're incredible. The, the host even eats one on the air. And so uh, that's an example of really consciously creating PR and focusing. And so there are so many things we do and are accessible. As a result, we measure it. We get five times more PR than our competitors do. And I measure. So the 1,000 people that bought, the members that came in yesterday morning in the three minutes after that segment are attributed to PR. I can track those names. I will track their spending over the next year. And all of that revenue goes to PR. And so once I do that, I realize, for example, December just went over, $1.3 million came in from PR that month, 100%. That understates it, obviously, because some people saw it, thought, oh my god, I'm a Guild member, I haven't been on for a month. Tonight, I'll go on and, and buy something. So we, that's harder to attribute there. But uh, the part in the beginning, we can absolutely attribute. So PR, incredibly important. Referrals. 
Um, I, I really juiced up, now everyone does it, so it's, uh, it's, it's more common, but really juiced up the referral program. Two years after we started, 60% of our revenue came from members who had been referred by a friend. Nothing more powerful than that. Some of that just happens on your own. Like, you know, every person that's come to Facebook has come because they were, uh, some, some friend invited them on. Um, but e shopping sites had not done that before. So what I did is I offered $25 credit to you if you invited your friend. And if your friend purchased something, then you get a $25 credit. We had, we had some people who figured out that you know, they had thousands of dollars of credits uh, because they invited all their friends. Um, as a side note, it's interesting just to show you that, and the theme in some ways in all marketing is that there is no silver bullet. There's no thing that you can say, look, this works. Because in some markets it works, some markets it doesn't. For some companies this works, it doesn't. You have to just try a lot of things, see what works, measure the data, and make decisions. We went to Japan with the exact same model and, uh, and the referral thing, we thought, this is genius, uh, let's, let's do it. And they, our Japanese members didn't like it. Because it turns out, to grossly stereotype, they're much nicer than Americans, and they felt bad about the idea that I'm gonna make money off my friend. And they just thought that was just sort of tasteless. And so we had to change it and split it so that I get $12 and you get $12. So we're in this together. Americans are like, I'm gonna make money off my friends all day long, all day long. So, um, so we, we, we didn't see that coming, but adjusted. Uh, the other thing we saw in Japan actually is that our sales here are at noon because it's lunchtime and people uh, apparently, obviously lots of people, millions of people feel comfortable shopping all day at work on their work computer, uh, which I encourage. By the way, if this, gets, if this gets boring at any time, just jump on your phone and you can buy clothes right now. <laughs> Don't feel bad about it at all. I, I, I take it really well. And they're all discounted. So, um, so in uh, Japan, we realized that they also don't feel comfortable uh, buying, buying clothes uh, all day long on their work computer. Uh, and so we had to move the sales to 9 o'clock at night so they could do it at home. So a lot of, a lot of great things about the Japanese culture. Um, but uh, in, in the US, uh, uh, the system has worked uh, pretty well. So referral is incredibly important. So the $25 is more than anyone had ever offered, and, but clearly uh, has, has made sense. <coughs> Email management, extraordinarily important for us. So, and because it's so important to us and our way of communicating with customers, obviously everyone out there, you can sign up for anything. Um, email lists on toothpaste, on anything. But for our business, it's very powerful because it changes every day. And so we, that email communication, 50% of our revenues comes from people getting those emails and then coming on the site. Um, so very, very important. So you have to be good at that. So one of the tests is if you're sending out you know, one email to everyone, uh, that's probably not a good idea. So the email you get in the morning from us is one of 2,000 versions. Every single night, we model the entire guilt database. And, and every single day, it changes. And then say, OK you should get in order these six sales, and you should get these six sales, you should get these six sales, um, based on your, your, not just your buying behavior, but what you've even looked at in the past. So the whole thing is modeled, very powerful. Some of you in the audience don't get a personalized email because at all times, about 5% are held out as a control group. Because otherwise, I can't tell whether the personalization is working. If I just personalize for everyone, those are just the results. 5% get nothing. You just get a standard email, the rest get personalized. <clears throat> and then we measure the incremental revenues that are coming in from personalization uh, every, every week and every month. Uh, and that's very, very important. So doing a good job there. Don't forget, and this is where marketing and product get very tied together, our site changes too. Not all of you see the same site. So is that product or is that marketing? So I, I think of it as marketing, but it actually comes up with product organization. So uh, I'm a Noir customer. There are 32,000 customers that are noir customers. Noir is sort of a uh, veiled uh, uh, reference to the black American Express card, and we put noir because it's French, and uh, it makes it very uh, high end. <clears throat> and so uh, our top customers get noir status. They've purchased generally between $10,000 and a million dollars on the site. Yes, there are consumers who have purchased a million dollars, and we know all the top customers. Um, there are some people who buy some, a lot of stuff uh, out there. Uh, and, but we encourage that. So, so, the, uh, so those you know, our customers see some different things than other customers. This is just one example. Um, and it's powerful for two reasons. One is 
uh, they can, they can the, the special bonuses like being a frequent flyer and your gold status, you want to get something better than the people who don't have it. The other thing is I can go to a brand and some brands will say, you know, Kevin, now you're so big, I don't know if I can discount to, to millions and millions of customers. I'll say to them, okay, I have an idea for you. Why don't you show, let's say it's uh, Xenia. Why don't we show your suits only to 25,000 men who have already purchased $1,000 worth of men's suiting online from us, from your competitors? Would you like to reach that group? I'm like, okay, I want to reach that group. And no one in the history of the fashion business has ever been able to do that. Like, think about it. how do you do that? You can't do direct marketing. You direct mail doesn't really work for Xenia suits other than your own lists. How do you reach other people's lists in a way? And so, and people who buy men's suits online is a customer you absolutely want. Because that's gonna be someone, the profile is gonna be someone who is well off, sophisticated, younger, who's a first mover. If you're buying suits online, you're really comfortable. You want that person for the next 25 years. Getting them now and getting them on, buying a Xenia suit and feeling good, extraordinarily important. So uh, that becomes a product and marketing thing that is uh, very, very powerful. That's important. Then you've got the whole category of um, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, and each business has different experiences there. So you know, there's one angle, which is on the customer support angle, that I'm gonna focus this on, that there are tons of people now, if they have a problem, they just complain on Facebook. And it is essential. Like if you're a business and you don't have full-time people monitoring all three of those, you are not doing the right thing. And so you wanna be jumping on that right away because what we'll do, if you say, look, I, I, I got a dress and it's terrible, I hate the quality, I hate the brand. We want right away to be on that and say, you know what, can I, can I reach you? Can I give you a call and can we work this out? And boom, you know, let me just take that dress back. I know you can't return it, you can return it, we'll take care of it. Person's super happy and it didn't build. So you didn't see 100 people retweeting that, because you know, things are gonna go wrong. We, we mail out 32,000 packages a day. Um, you know, stuff's just gonna go wrong. Um, at one point, a package, this actually wasn't our fault, although there's thousands of things at one point that were our fault that we did wrong, but a package, the label fell off at the UPS center, and somehow they just grabbed the label here and put it on. Anyway, uh, this person received, um, in the uh, guilt box, received uh, four porn magazines and a bunch of what looked like dirty laundry, no idea why it was all together. <laughs> And, they, and, and the person called up and said, uh, what's going on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so we're like, we're not really sure how this happened. We're gonna try and track this down. It did not come from us, but uh, it is weird, I agree, because the label is on there. Um, and so we were able to eventually track it down. Uh, so you wanna jump on those, because that's a story that, while sort of funny here, if 50 billion people on Twitter are talking about it, it's not so funny for us uh, when, uh, when, when things go wrong. So monitoring those three, very, very important on the customer support point of view. Um, getting people uh, signing up new members. All three categories are great for signing up new members. Pinterest a little bit less so for us. Uh, Pinterest for some reason is more focused on food and travel. So our jet setter business does very well on Pinterest um, because it's so picture oriented and visual oriented. Uh, but yeah, Facebook and Twitter have generated you know, tens of thousands of members for us. Uh, the pages are important. So managing that and just being on top of it is a very important uh, part of getting uh, new customers. BD deals, very, very important for us. So how do we, getting the word out with partners. So there, um, White Collar is a TV show coming up. They're running ads right now. If you watch TV all week, you'd see two things. You'd see Guilt, we we're having a special offer and did a special sale yesterday uh, that we tied with them. White Collar's a great, well-dressed guys in suits. So we did a special sale around that and they actually did free commercials for us, driving people to the site where they could have special discounts uh, there. And so we've had, we've probably sent out uh, over the last two years, 200 million emails from partners to their customers about us. Uh, I'll give you the best example of somehow we, way we craft things. Again, all member acquisition, all marketing. Starbucks, uh, like two years ago, Howard Schultz called me up and said, look, can we do something together? This would be really great. Um, we have uh, 4,000 bags of the most expensive coffee we've ever done. So it's from the Galapagos, and it's like three times the cost of our normal coffee, and we can't put it in the stores because we have more stores than we have even bags of coffee. It doesn't make sense. So what we did is we crafted a sale where we made it available only to Gold Card members 
at Starbucks. It actually wasn't available for, for guilt members. So it's another example of our site where you're seeing part of it, but you're not, we have sales occurring on the site that aren't available even for guilt customers. So then these gold card members, 700,000 people were invited to have first access at this really great coffee. We crafted it, a sale for them that had coffee and the most expensive coffee maker you've ever seen, one of these like $400, um, really great there, and a trip to the Galapagos, organized by Jetson. When you looked at the whole thing, it made you think, God, the Galapagos are really great. They're these beautiful those coffee makers. Who doesn't want a coffee maker like that? It's so great. And the coffee seemed actually quite inexpensive compared to the $8,000 Galapagos trip and the $400 uh, coffee. We didn't expect to sell a lot of the other two. We sold every single coffee maker. 25,000 people signed up for Gilt that day, producing a million dollars of business over the next 12 months. So, and had a great experience. And, and, and Howard was incredibly happy. We've done things with Starbucks since then. Um, so a great, great combination of how you can individually craft uh, deals to get members to think about marketing. Um, SEO, very important for Gilt. So uh, we opened up the site. The site, you couldn't crawl the site in the very beginning. Google, we didn't let Google crawl it, now we let it crawl it. And we actually now get millions of dollars. This year will be 20, 25 million dollars worth of revenue coming from crawling the site because even, and it, we thought it would be a way of getting new customers, it actually turns out it's existing customers. So that a guilt customer doesn't realize that we have Mark Jacobs coming up, they do a, a search for Mark Jacobs uh, discount, guilt shows up, they're like, oh my god, I'm a guilt customer. Boom, they come to the site. And so we crafted thousands and thousands of pages. Sometimes we have Mark Jacobs current, sometimes we don't. And so we'll have a nice page, a nice landing page uh, for something like that. So uh, that has been a, a big generator of, uh, of revenue. Um, TV advertising, we have TV advertising running right now for the first time, started in November. Um, and we compare that to online advertising, which is probably our largest source. Everyone knows that, but buying keywords, uh, display, those two categories uh, we put side by side, because I want to have a return, I want to have a 12 month return, not on revenues, but on gross margin dollars. When a customer comes in, if I spent you know, $10 getting that customer, I need to get $10 back over the next 12 months to feel like that's a, uh, a good investment. So uh, we're running TV courses right now, um, and we have two separate ones going head to head, and so far that is working as well, or slightly better. Uh, online, I mean, uh, TV uh, a absolutely works. We have not found that for us print works. Print, two things we find have not worked for us, which either means one of two things, we're not good at it, or not doing the right things, or that it just doesn't work for our type of business. Um, but uh, both print and sort of sponsorship. So, so we're not convinced, other than the very beginning industry focus, sponsoring a fashion show because we're trying to reach people in the fashion industry. Uh, but from a consumer point of view, we're not, the sponsorships for us don't work as well. Um, and and uh, so those are the big two categories. Having said that, we have actually launched a magazine as well. So we have a magazine called Du Jour, um, which, we, which we launched uh, six months ago. Very high end, controlled circulation. <laughs> profitable, uh, because I thought of all the categories you see in a high-end fashion magazine, actually most of them are guilt categories. So why don't I get that word out there, but how do I do that? So put together a magazine, we have 30 people, worked with Jason Bin, who had launched the Hamptons magazine and most of the glossy magazines in the last 15 years. So he works with us, and uh, that, that has all kinds of benefits. Our editors can, can get their message out subtly there. It goes to the top 100,000 Gilt customers, which is a very, very attractive audience to, um, to brands. And then it goes to another 150,000 people, but only based on really million dollar income or above or some other criteria. So the average person reading this magazine, probably it makes you know, triple what a reader of Vogue reads, uh, makes. And so with your brand, the reality is that's who you want to reach. Um, and so you'll pay a premium to reach that, that audience. You need people who can afford your products. And, uh, and that's, that's a good audience. So it's actually somewhat hard to find. It's intentional. Uh, there's a lot of benefit. And I think um, uh, one of the things that Gilt has shown, and we try and do in a lot of things, is that having some scarcity is, is essential. Um, you know, there's a tendency in all businesses to just overproduce because you're always worried about missing that dollar of revenue. But from a brand point of view, 
uh, pulling that back slightly. It's the difference when you play musical chairs. You know, there's eight people in eight chairs. It's not a really fun game. Just got to remove that one chair. One chair changes everything, and people kill each other. And from a marketing point of view, uh, that's what you want. Uh, you got to make sure that uh, there, there's, there's scarcity there. Let me make sure I'm on time here. Um, so uh, so the, I find that from a guilt point of view, the complicated part is the interaction of all these things. Because really, we have, we have about 11 different areas within marketing. Um, and so the question is, what, uh, when someone sees a SEO ad, but they were reinforced by the PR that morning, you know, I do have a problem in attribution. Because we'll go through and each one of the 11 programs looks like it was profitable, but if you add them all up, it is less than what we saw. It was more than what we actually saw in results, which means that there's double counting. Really difficult, though, to, to show exactly where the double counting occurred, because I can't figure out who saw the thing on Good Morning America and uh, you know, read an article in DuJour about us and had uh, you know, an SEO piece, and there might be three, four, or five. Now, Everyone knows uh, from a TV point of view, uh, more is better up to a certain point. They're diminishing returns. Um, but, but in general, more is better in the beginning. So I think it's good, but it, it can force us, it can lead us down the path of making the wrong decision in over-investing some areas if they're not truly incremental. Uh, so we, we balance it all the time. One of the things, as I was saying in the beginning uh, about marketing, uh, you know, it's a great, great career for those of you who are deciding what you're going to do now. Um, if, and uh, I'll bet, you know, Alfredo knows this very well from a MasterCard point of view. We, uh, we worked together actually at uh, Disney 20 years ago. Um, the, the, there is a shortage of great marketing people. And if you call up a search firm, if I were here uh, representing, you know, Spencer Stewart, you call them up and say, like, looking for a CMO, they will tell you, they will reduce your expectations right away. And they'll say, look, that's hard. It's hard to get great people. Uh, it's going to be difficult. There's a shortage. Because the skill sets have changed. And the, the, now you need to, to be able to be comfortable in all these different areas. And then new things happen. So even you know, Gilt, I think it was a pretty recent company. I mean, it's you know, roughly five years old. Um, when we started, there was no mobile. When, the day we started, mobile didn't exist. And essentially, Facebook, although it existed, it wasn't our, our, our consumers were not using it that much. Twitter literally didn't exist, and Pinterest didn't exist. So you, know, you have to be able to adapt and move quickly. So mobile now, last month, and I know this is true of Facebook as well, and my, my younger brother works at Facebook. He's uh, in charge of the gaming area of Facebook. So uh, it's something I, I think about a fair amount, and it's a, a great company. Um, uh, more than 50% of our traffic now comes from the iPad or iPhone. And that's unusually high for e-commerce. And what happened was that flash sales, two elements led to that. Flash sales companies have more mobile than uh, non-flash sales sites. The reason for that is that if we're sitting on Saturday at a soccer game together watching kids play soccer, and uh, I tell you there's this great book you should buy, you probably just say, you know, I'm not going to buy it right now. I'll, I'll tonight. When I get home, I'll, I'll buy. I'll go to Amazon. I'll buy it. But if I tell you that there's a uh, flash sale coming up in one hour, you know on Gilt, you've got to be on there now, because it's going to be gone. And true of all flash sales. There's shortage. As a result, you can't wait to get home. As a result, you get used to going on and, and using uh, mobile. So uh, that, in a short period of time, changes all of our numbers. For a while, we were concerned we thought the conversion was going down. Conversion is a huge metric when you look at the funnel that we pay uh, tremendous attention. How many members, how many came to the site, how many people clicked on, on this, how many went down, how many people put in their cart, how many people uh, purchased, and then what's the average price that they purchased, which leads you to your revenues. So we're watching that funnel uh, all day long and comparing it all the time. And we started seeing conversion drops. And so normally that, that means that somehow what you're offering is not that attractive, um, consumers are getting sick of it, whatever it is. And also, we realized that it was a period where mobile was starting to become significant, but we weren't really breaking it out. And as a result, what happens in mobile is that typical consumer who went used to come to our site three times a week uh, when they were in the office. Now, uh, in a taxi, was starting to come to the site as well. And so they, you know, they're bored, like you guys right now. And you just go on the site, and you're thinking, well, I wonder what's on today. Let me buy something. 
your conversion, because you're not, you're, you're just kind of bored, it's not gonna be as high as sort of a dedicated focus shopper. It's also not at the peak time during the day um, at 12 o'clock where everything is new. Uh, as a result, you are, your number of times you come to the site may double for us, and your, the number of times you buy is gonna go up by like 1.4 times. Conversion has come down, so we have to break out our numbers and have mobile conversion and site conversion, and just understand that we're gonna get less productive traffic. And then of course mobile, you have to subdivide between iPad and iPhone. iPad is really not, not mobile, for some reason it gets thrown into mobile, but it's not, it's, you know, it's like a computer. When I'm at home, I pull out my iPad or my uh, laptop, it's the same thing. It's when you're on your iPhone, it's a little bit different. And so we have to notice and, and comment. And the, but this, the, the point of this all is really that this is a huge shift. I mean, you know, how many times uh, does, does a, a, a company that's doing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue say that you know, they, in a period of two and a half years, 50% shift in the devices that their consumers are shopping on and changes all the numbers, it changes the marketing. The second reason, I, I said there were two reasons why mobile is important to us. One is just flash sales. The second is that it, we haven't done everything right, but in mobile we were very aggressive very early and, and, and quite good. If I had a dedicated 12 person team doing mobile apps uh, very early on, and what I found in the last 10 years is when you see the trend hitting, which is actually uh, you know, Google AdWords you know, 12 years ago, um, Facebook early on, uh, mobile early on, it's incredibly cheap to get members. And so that becomes your most productive area. If you wait two years because you're not really sure, you're back to market prices. And then you're competing with everyone, you can still do a good job, but you can't do that unbelievable job. I mean, you know, people forget they used to be able to get uh, by you know, Google words for you know, pennies that are probably 10 times the price today. Not only that, the members are more valuable. The people who went, the, the first, you know, whatever it was, five million people who got smartphones, those are the hardcore. Those are the hardcore, they're still the hardcore. They're first movers, they're great, you want those people. Getting them early was cheaper to get better members. So that, when we look back at the impact of doing that, uh, it's quite substantial. So, and that can be over, over time because we can, we can follow every member and, this is interesting about our business, we can follow a member, everyone you invited, everyone they invited, it's sort of like an Adam and Eve, if you put internet shopping on top of it, uh, down and watch it. So there are numbers by every single person. Uh, so uh, Alexandra, who is one of the, the co-founders I mentioned, who had the largest number of female friends in shopping, um, her number is 100 million. So she has led $100 million worth of purchases this year came from people from her chain. Uh, that's unusual because obviously if you're the first person almost at uh, guilt, it's gonna be a big number. Uh, but we have a number by every person which tells how valuable they are uh, across the board. So the theme here is really incredible amounts of data. As you can see on each one of these, if I went further in depth, there is a number associated with almost everything we do, whether it's personalization, whether it's referrals, whether it's PR, everything has a number. It is, has to be buttresses by the brand, so they make sure that, you know, yet there are things we turn down every single day because it's not brand appropriate. So that's the only thing that has to uh, be established as a counterbalance uh, in, in what you're doing. But marketing today has is, is, is become the core, the core element of how so many companies are successful. It's become more complicated, it's become more interesting, and so I'm glad you're here today learning all about it. And when you figure it out, explain it to me, and we'll do great things together. So uh, let me wrap up and just see if there's any questions that uh, people have. I see a microphone waiting around. Yeah? You mentioned that there are 11 programs that you monitor. Can you say what those are, please? Yeah, let me make sure I have them all here. I think I wrote them down. So referral, email, PR, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, TV, print, SEO, internet advertising, business development deals, and sponsorships. 12. Probably more, too. But uh, we have to track all of them. Yeah, so uh, what we end up getting, we probably, it, 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 it's hard to generalize to believe, we get a couple percent increase through, purely through the personalization. So for us, that's you know, 10, 20 million dollars a year, just by doing that. 
The other thing you need to remember is that it's not only is it just good for business, it's good for the consumer. Because we're showing you, especially, we're, what's fundamentally different on our site is that we're not a search-based site. You can do search, but at Amazon, uh, personalization in a way doesn't matter as much as it does for us. Because if I'm going in to buy a book, I'm going to buy that book. All you can do is say people bought this book, bought other books. When you come to Guilt, you don't know what you're going to buy. So what you <coughs> view is so important. Uh, and so over time, I think this is going to be the area that will yield the biggest returns for us in the next couple of years. So we're doing more and more interesting things, that, and I think much more than most other people. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. You said earlier that when you're starting a business, do no advertising. Yeah. Did you do it now? Yes. There was a time in which you didn't, there was a time in which you did. How did you know sure. when the right time was, and when are you how do you know when to add additional mm -hmm. channels to the mix, like television, which you just added? How does that happen? Yeah. The second part, there's no formula. The first part, I would, if you were coming saying, look, I think we should start advertising, one of my first questions would be, do you know the lifetime value of your customer? Like, and, you, and are you going to know perfectly? No, but do you have a really good guess? You've seen a pattern. You can see the people you, you signed up 12 months ago, and so you know how much to pay. Because at the end of the day, let's not forget, this is like a factory. You are paying you know, for members, customers coming in, and you're going to get an output of what they spend with you. And obviously, that has to be higher. And so if you don't know the former, I don't know how you're going to do the latter. Because you're not comparing it to anything. So you can have a gut feel, but I just want to have more confidence on, on that point. And so you, and you want to ease into it. You want to ease into it. So how do you add things? I don't think there is a formula there. I mean, sometimes you, they don't plan. All of a sudden, you realize that everyone's on Facebook, and so you need to be on Facebook. Or everyone's on Twitter. You need to be there. You need to try it out and see what the results are. You, you need to try it out early, quickly, because that's the, uh, the source of the biggest opportunity, as I said before. But I don't think there's a formula there. And also, you have to trade off. You can't have everything. You know, we have more people in marketing because there's so many different things we have to do. If we were just doing TV commercials, you know, I'd have like six people. And this doesn't take that many people you use an agency to run commercials. Doing all this is much more complicated. And you've got to make sure that it pays off. But there's a lot more data available, which is good. Yeah? Our strategy versus competitors? <laughs> So um, yeah, it's a more, it, it, the, the complicated answer is that uh, although in a business environment you think about flash sales, <coughs> but from our point of view, flash sales are a very small part of the competitive landscape. Because if I flipped it around and I said, let's go into your closet right now, you know, you, out of all things you can buy, all your clothing, and probably, I wish it all came from flash sales sites, but it doesn't. You buy from Saks, you buy from catalogs, you buy from outlet malls. And so we, the flash sales sector, actually only have, you know, 1%. You know, together we do, in women's, we do probably a billion dollars of women's clothing, and the whole sector is 100 billion, 200 billion. You know, TJ Maxx this year will do $20 billion. That's just one chain. Ross stores will do 14 billion. And they're doing discount clothing. So, um, so our consumers, we don't think head to head uh, as much. Um, and there, we don't have, actually in men's, we don't have very many competitors there. Uh, our competitors are offline. Rue probably overlaps the most, but a little bit less. You think we have some overlapping brands um, and a lot that are not. Uh, so it's not like a double click or uh, in particular, there are basically like three competitors. And so, and people could only choose one of those three. And so you had to focus every minute of every day on what, what the other person does. Here it's, in some ways we have so many competitors, but they're not flash sale sites. It's a little less important. Thank you. Okay, thank you.